All right, welcome everyone uh, to our, our webinar, Evolving Your Claims Quality Program to Meet New Demands. We're still about a minute early here. We're gonna get things going uh, in just about two minutes or so. So um, hang tight if you guys are, are in the queue here. Uh, we'll get going shortly with the panel. Again, for those just joining us, we will get started in about uh, 30 seconds at this point. Appreciate everyone just holding tight. Okay, well, thank you very much everyone for joining today's webinar, Evolving Your Claims Quality Program to Meet New Demands. Uh, the webinar is being recorded, so um, uh, once we're able to take the recording and, and send it out, we will do so likely early next week. Uh, today's discussion is gonna focus on the challenges and opportunities insurers face when trying to evolve their, their claims quality assurance programs. Uh, the group that you see in front of you here will share how they have worked to grow their own uh, claims quality programs and help to provide useful tips on how you can drive quality in your own organization. Uh, the discussion is meant to be open and honest and, and informative and interactive. And, and to that extent, uh, we'll have a couple of polls that'll pop up during the chat where we ask you, the audience, to answer them and help to drive the discussion. Uh, you'll also have the opportunity to submit questions throughout the discussion in that GoToWebinar widget that you see on your screen. Uh, before we get this started, I'd like to um, uh, introduce our panelists and give a little bit of background to Athenium Analytics. So a little bit of background to the company. Athenium Analytics is a company focused on helping insurance and government clients to mitigate risk and solve pressing issues. We provide tools for claims, uh, underwriting, quality assurance that really focus around data ag aggregation and rich visual analysis, uh, machine learning and computer vision, and predictive analytics. We have uh, around 100 employees that are in three different offices, uh, DC, New Hampshire, and Boston, but really over the last few months, it's been closer to 100 different offices. TeamThink itself has been around for nearly 20 years, though it continues to evolve as, as companies get more sophisticated in their needs, uh, including the release of TeamThink Envoy for claims late last year, of which uh, all three panelists um, utilized and our upcoming release of Team Think Envoy for underwriting next month. We currently serve over 60,000 registered users in dozens of countries performing um, over 150,000 monthly re reviews. So that's a little bit about Athenium Analytics, a little bit about Team Think. We'll talk a little bit more about Team Think a little later on in the discussion, but I do want to introduce the panelists uh, that you see in front of you here that are going to be helping out with today's discussion. Uh, first up on your top left there, Robert Young. Uh, Robert Young has been working in the insurance in the industry for 31 years. 
and is currently the Assistant Vice President of Auto and Recreational Marine at Berkeley One. Berkeley One is part of the WR Berkeley Corporation family of companies and provides coverage to high net worth individuals across home, auto, liability, flood, and travel. Uh, next up, next to Robert, and, and by the way, you may hear us uh, affectionately refer to Robert as Doc throughout the, uh, uh, the, the panel discussion here. We know Robert well enough, and, and he's been gracious enough to allow us to call him Doc in case we, we slip up a little bit. Uh, next to Doc there, you have Kate Townley. Kate Townley has been working in the insurance in the industry since 2012 and at various underwriting managers since 2016, currently as a senior claims analyst and support lead. Veris Underwriting Managers is part of the WR Berkeley Corporation family of companies and is an excess and surplus lines carrier offering commercial liability, garage, and professional liability products in all 50 states. Uh, finally, off to my right, uh, we have Kirsten Tibbet. Kirsten Tibbet is a senior quality assurance specialist at Mutual of Inimclaw and has been working in the insurance industry for over 30 years now. Mutual Venom Claw provides coverage in seven states, including products for individuals, families, farm, and businesses through local independent agents. Venom Claw is nationally recognized for its claim service and has received an A prime stability rating from Demotech. Aside from the panelists from um, uh, these other companies that are joining us, um, we also have my colleague, Christina Guzman. Christina Guzman is an insurance QA account manager at Athenium Analytics, where she works with some of the largest national and international carriers on implementing and enhancing their quality assurance program. Uh, before joining Athenium Analytics in 2019, Christina spent over 23 years in the insurance industry, working in claims and quality assurance for a range of national, regional, and specialty carriers. Christina is a graduate of the University of Texas. Longhorns, there we go. <laughs> Waiting for it. And provides a unique perspective as both an insurance QA account manager and a former client of Athenium Analytics. Um, then myself, Mike Bennett, I am the Vice President of Sales at Athenium Analytics. Um, in my time with the company, I've worked closely with product teams, I've worked with tech teams, uh, strategic account management teams on helping to drive uh, the development of our products and, and drive the industries that we serve. Um, my background is actually in meteorology and data, uh, but I've found the quality assurance uh, realm to be quite interesting, and I've, I've been diving deep into it uh, over the last year and a half or so. So now that we have a, um, uh, a, an introduction to our, our panelists for today and who's going to be talking, uh, we also have a set agenda. Uh, we want to cover uh, five broad questions that revolve around quality assurance. You can see some of the, the topics up here. But again, we hope that throughout this webinar, throughout this discussion, that it is a, a true discussion, even though in a virtual setting where you can ask questions uh, through that, that webinar widget, uh, you'll answer the polls that'll help to drive the discussion. Um, and we'll get to some of those in the Q&A uh, at the end of this. So without further ado, I've introduced her already, but I do wanna bring back in Christina. Uh, who's going to be moderating the discussion. Christina? Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our webinar this afternoon. I'm glad you all could join us, um, and I'm happy that we have three panelists from three different diverse areas of insurance um, who are all using the Envoy product, but who use it and come from different experiences using the product. So um, it'll be great to hear from all their um, extensive experiences and different perspectives uh, as we talk about how we can uh, drive quality in your departments as you grow your QA department. So as Mike mentioned earlier, um, we're going to uh, interject some polls for the audience to be able to participate. And so right off the bat, we have our first poll coming through. Uh, next slide, here we go. And it is, what is the top pain point you have experienced in trying to grow your QA organization? Um, if you would, please select one of A through D, A, extensive labor hours to pull and analyze data, B, poor analytics and reporting, C, subjective scoring or quality management, and D, inability to use data to drive organizational changes. Um, all of those could be <laughs> applicable to your QA organization, but we're asking you choose the best one or maybe the most, uh, the most that you've experienced that applies for your organization. 
and we'll pull up the poll results here in just a few seconds. But this will help lead a discussion as we get into the warning signs and the common hurdles that happen in a QA department and uh, how we can identify if we need uh, to try and grow our organization. So um, do we have audience poll information yet? All right, so we've got some ties um, and I figured that we would. Um, so uh, all three at the top, extensive labor hours to pull and analyze the data. That's always important because the man hours are important to uh, QA departments, especially if you have a smaller one. Poor analytics and reporting, uh, also important for the same reasons. Subjective scoring and quality measurements. I have found experience in the past that the smaller the QA organization, the more subjective it can become. Um, and then driving organizational changes, just rounding up the bottom there. Um, but it is also important to be able to drive organizations with quality analytics and reporting um, that you would be able to pour, pull from the information uh, in your data. So with that, I think we'll lead into the first question, which are, what are the warning signs? What are the signs that indicate, and this is to our panelists here, what are the signs that indicate an organization's need to grow or evolve its QA program. Um, Kirsten, or sorry, Kate, uh, do you have any information on this? Absolutely. So the the first thing I think that would be indicative is finding inconsistencies in claim files or underwriting files or whatever you're reviewing. Just over the course of a normal review process or just in passing while working a file and that leads to a need to be able to track, measure, report, and address those inconsistencies in a structured manner. For us, because we have a very small department, we have six adjusters, we feel it's important to launch a program like that early on so we have time to work it into our overall department workflow as we grow as a company. All right, consistency is always the stickler there. How about Kirsten? Well, I would offer that um, you kind of have to take a step back and take a look at what it is that you want to achieve with your QA program. Um, things like being able to verify compliance with against external legal and regulatory standards, um, measuring your performance uh, against standard industry practices. Um, like Kate's mentioned, you know, evaluating the adherence to your own internal practices that you've set up, and then just having some means to identify and present those future risk exposures to make sure that you're um, aligning with the organization's risk appetite. Right, absolutely. Alignment with the organization is a huge one, and also um, adhering to those regulatory and compliance items that are necessary to run a proper claims department, uh, which is what the QA is there to ensure happens. Um, how about Doc? Any thoughts yeah, I'd on like this? To, uh, yeah, absolutely. So, you know, when, when taking a look at this question, um, focusing on um, needs or evolving a QA program, you know, consistency is, is going to be an important process to make sure that you're meeting those those consistent um, file handling or, or documentations within a claim file. Um, understanding what specific results or goals the organization wants to meet and being able to consistently drive to those goals. So even as a as a younger organization, you want to I, you want to develop that in a way of being able to start off on the right foot, being able to build that consistency. And Kirsten brought up a, a, a great point in regulatory requirements. Uh, that could be a little bit of a challenge as whether you're a mature organization and you're in a numerous states or you're a smaller organization building out from state to state, making sure that you're meeting those regulatory requirements um, on a consistent basis within a claim file. Right, and keeping those regulations straight uh, is also one of the uh, high points when you're dealing with uh, many different states, I would imagine. I would offer that the challenge. approaches that we take is to, uh, because we are in uh, seven to eight states, is that we take the state that has the highest bar and we put that as our um, 
as our goal. If we can match that state's compliance um, guidelines, then we will be able to match it in the rest of the states. So that might be an approach people take. Because it is very difficult to know every uh, all the regulatory compliance guidelines in every individual state out there. Right. So raise the bar in those states where the bars aren't that high and use the, the highest bar states as your as your guideline or your baseline. Absolutely. How much so one other point on that I, too. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, Go before ahead, we do one, yeah, one other point that I wanted to bring up was, you know, um, from an organizational standpoint, stagnant results may indicate that, you know, you need to revisit your questions or you need to develop or evolve the QA program. And I think that's an important part of it is being able to adjust your your questions or your questionnaire in order to be able to develop or meet those uh, goals that you're trying to meet as an organization. So saying the results can also um, be an indicator of, of you driving um, to evolve in the QA program. Right, and I'd even add on to that that um, alongside stagnant results, maybe higher than expected results. Um, at an inconsistent rate, that could also uh, identify that you have some subjective items that you need to ha address at that point. Great. All right, I think we can move on to question two, which are, what are the common hurdles you face when designing a QA program, both within the program itself and across the whole organization? And I will open this up to the panel. From our perspective, there's obviously the first step, which is the cost-benefit analysis, whether or not it's worth the manpower, worth the hours to have an entire QA department or to have one or two individuals cross-trained in QA. Uh, there really is that approach from a smaller standpoint. There's also the concern, is it going to be user-friendly? Is it going to be <clears throat> usable to anybody who might be reviewing it or actually completing the QA? And then, of course, whether or not the results of that process can be presented in a consumable manner. Uh, for example, prior to signing on with Envoy, we were using Excel spreadsheets for our QA process, which is great for a geek like me, where I like everything to be Excel and lined up like that. But for upper management, they don't have time to go through 27 tabs to look at all of that data. They want it in one concise place so that they don't have to spend all the extra time reviewing. So that was a big consideration, at least from our perspective, of having something that's both usable for the reviewer, but also consumable by the upper management. Right, and the man hours and the, just the actual return on investment that you get from being able to uh, identify the information at a faster pace than say across 27 tabs in an Excel workbook, right? <laughs> mm -hmm. I would offer that. I, I will if we're talking about hurdles, um, I, in my opinion, uh, QA needs to be objective and it needs to be independent from the claims department uh, and that particular leadership hierarchy, which then allows the leaders to drive towards the outcomes that they want. But again, it depends on the size of the organization. Maybe you don't have the manpower, which you can have that separate one or two or however large it may be in some of the bigger carriers. A separate's got to be within the claims department. Um, the other hurdle, and we kind of spoke to it at, in the first question, is just making sure that you understand what is the department strategy, what are the objectives, how is QA going to support that, um, and you know what's the overall risk appetite and tolerance within the claims department or within the organization. Um, so that you're developing this program um, and that you're, you're there to uh, align and support um, that you're not going to get in the way or hinder what's, what the direction is of the organization. Right, absolutely. Supporting the organization as a whole is, should be one of the major goals of a, of a QA department. Go ahead, Doc. Yeah, I, I can appreciate what Kate said uh, regarding uh, a spreadsheet audit. Um, that was what we were using prior to uh, joining Envoy and, and using Team Think Envoy. Uh, with that, creates some some challenges in when you develop that spreadsheet questionnaire, being able to pivot if you're not getting the right results or 
if the data comes out too general and being able to accumulate that data together to really provide uh, a, a, a good summary report of really what's going on within the, the audit results itself. Um, I think that some of the hurdles that you face are creating questions that may not be significant to what you're trying to measure um, and not really showing you what the uh, metrics are in order to achieve the, the organizational results. Um, data can become very general, and if it's not specific enough, it makes it difficult to really focus in on what needs to be improved. Right, so really getting into the details and uh, constructing the correct questions to be able to get at those details and find the trends, um, the needles in the haystack, so to speak. I will say um, that how one about of the, leakage? Sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead, Doc. I'm sorry. I, I just wanted to say one of the benefits of moving to Envoy was having the flexibility to be able to change the questionnaire um, and be able to adjust it um, in order to uh, meet certain specific requirements that you're looking for. So compared to using a spreadsheet, which was very difficult. So I, I will say that's one of the benefits of, of uh, that I found with Envoy. Right, I would absolutely agree with you on that. Um, any other last comments or thoughts on the common hurdles? If not, we have an additional poll coming up for our audience. And if we could switch to the poll. Um, knowing the common hurdles and the warning signs that um, we've just discussed, um, what would you pick as the primary goal of your QA organization? Um, would it be regulatory compliance or training opportunities or lowering leakage or adjuster performance measurement? Um, all of these are different types of uh, QA organizations or directions or focus, if you will, uh, for department. Um, and again, it should align with what the uh, claims department wants as a goal as well. So keeping those in mind, if the audience wouldn't mind, taking a stab at either picking A through D and what was uh, what is most the most primary goal of your QA organization, thinking about your own organization. Um, I think that maybe we might have some results at this point. Let's take a look. All right. It's interesting. So regulatory compliance is a little bit less than training opportunities. So it looks like at least our audience is wanting to make sure that we have uh, the right training in place for uh, the claims organization. Um, regulatory compliance uh, after that, which I think that those two could probably be hand in hand um, because one supports the other, as well as lowering leakage. Um, that is one of the major points of a QA organization to identify where the leakage is, what um, issue it's stemming from and then how to fix that. Um, then everything circles back to um, in performance improvement or improvement as a claims organization and then your adjuster performance measurement uh, coming in last at a D there uh, at 14%. Um, sometimes it is the goal of a QA organization to include those measurements um, as part of an adjuster's performance. Um, but as we see from the poll here, um, not as popular as just enhancing the training of their staff and making sure that they stay in compliance and making sure they keep an eye on leakage. So that's um, very interesting, true to, true to point there. So thinking about the way that you answered that poll, um, we're looking at question number three now is taking into account of what your goals are, um, how would you establish the foundation benchmarks and metrics to qualify across your organization? Um, so from each of your perspectives, from your QA department, how would you, um, how would you depict how your experience leads you ask for this question? Well, for okay, us Kirsten. in particular, oh, sorry. Or Kate. No, you're good. <laughs> Go ahead, Kate. Um, well, for Veris, we have a best practices and guidelines document that we update regularly in collaboration with our compliance department. And we use that as the primary benchmark for building out our questionnaire. We also uh, have an audit document that our corporate office, WR Berkeley, uses that we supplement our questionnaire with. 
and that covers all the all the basics of what we as an organization want to be monitored and what our corporation wants to be monitored. And then we supplement that with a library of reference documents for our adjusters so that when they get dinged on an item, they can go out and see why they got dinged, why we enforce this particular item on our QA process. That word ding seems to be happening less and less these days. <laughs> We I, I've seen challenges <laughs> marked, I've seen opportunities marked, but I do still hear the dings every now and then. <laughs> How about uh, Kirsten or Doc? I'll, uh, I'll chime in here. Uh, no pun intended with the ding. Um, so one way that we've tried to avoid uh, that, and I see that it was last on there, the adjuster performance, is we focus on more at a line of business and team. Uh, you know, you, when you're doing your review, certainly it's an individual file review, but you take the, the element of the individual out of it, and we're trying to look for those drivers of uh, the behaviors across a team or across a line of business so that we can have that information to turn around and share that with all, rather than it's not a performance management um, approach. The other thing I wanted to share is that um, we use it in a way that certainly you've got your regulatory compliance aspect of it, which can be separate. It can be mixed in with the quality, but um, maybe it is better to be a standalone um, aspect of it because it's very black and white. And when you're measuring a, a claim file, uh, there can be some subjectivity that comes in, in, even though you've got this quantitative analytical approach in answering, uh, you know, template questionnaires. Uh, the other piece is to is the quality, which is a big component of any type of QA program. And depending on the organization, um, as Kate mentioned, you might have a specific focus. You know, some might focus on a timing aspect. How, how are we moving the process along? Whereas some uh, organizations might focus on customer service. And so then you're building in those uh, questions that allow you to um, drive to those areas that are important for your organization. And that, that's, that's very important to be able to do. Um, lastly, I would say that you can then use a tool to go down and do some slant, some focus reviews when you only want to take a slant of a particular file and look at, you know, what, what it's kind of a deep dive into one particular issue that seems to be coming up again and again. And then lastly, because the, the tool allows for the measurement of leakage, um, you, you have that included in with the quality aspect. Right, and I know um, Doc being over um, APD mainly, um, leakage is a big is a is a big trending item for you, or one that you track mostly. Um, so, how would you establish foundation benchmarks? Yeah, le leakage is a very important part of I think of any organization, um, and I think that from an organizational standpoint, um, that's one of the goals that you want to be focused on. Um, in, in really addressing the question of foundational benchmarks, being a smaller claims unit or a smaller claims team, um, utilizing what ben what um, the uh, I would say the regulatory requirements along with best practices to help build that the benchmarking metrics that you need to measure against. Um, typically, with a more mature organization. They have the historical data that they're able to utilize in order to create the benchmarks. Um, that's what we are developing as we continue to grow and making sure that once we develop the proper benchmarks based on the QA questionnaire, the results, we're able to build on how the quality is going to work. So really focusing on do the best practice really generate consistency within a claim file uh, along with regulatory requirements. Are we meeting and exceeding those organizational goals that are expected? So would it be fair to say that um, QA benchmarks and metrics uh, run in a cycle with the QA department 
or improvement processes across the board. Is that the way it works uh, across your organization? I would say so. Um, obviously, when you work to build out those benchmarks, um, depending on how you're measuring or how often you're measuring, you're going to see different cycles. So being able to develop a, okay, we're we going to measure quarterly, yearly, biannually, and being able to develop that benchmark to say, okay, this is where we're at. This is where we would like to be. And then making sure that the best practices and the regulatory requirements are um, driving you to that organizational result. All right, Kristen or Kate, anything to add? Good. Well, that actually leads us into our fourth question, which is about continuous improvement. And uh, what would be the best way to utilize the rich QA data that you receive now to drive continuous improvement in your department? Or through your experience, what you've seen in the past versus now? Um, how about Kirsten? Well, I think um, it's really about the story. And so the more information you have to be able to tell the story uh, to those department leaders, the better off you're going to be. Uh, there's going to be fewer surprises. You know, it's effective use of some resources. And, and ultimately, it benefits your policyholders. Um, but being able to identify the, the root causes, the drivers of that behavior, as I said before, is a really important component. And then it's what you do with the data. Um, I consider myself a storyteller. And the best way that I can tell a, a story is by being able to illustrate um, the, the data in a way that is you know, pretty self-explanatory. Um, you know, leaders don't have a lot of time. They, wanna, they want that you know, one number or that one driver or that one issue that keeps coming up, um, or they want to know if, if, in fact, we are having leakage issues. So for me to be able to tell the story, I need that rich data. Um, and it makes my job easier and it makes the, the audience um, appreciate what I have to offer. Right, I would absolutely agree with you. Kate or Doc? From my perspective, um, on building on what Kirsten said, a communication of your results is key. You can you know, QA all the claims that you have on your inventory, but if you don't do anything with that data, then you're not telling a story. You're, you're not doing the, the data justice. So being able to communicate it to the, the claim handlers who may or may not need coaching, communicate it to upper management who may, need, may or may not be need to be alerted to a potential pattern or situation. If you're not communicating the data, then you're wasting your time. And that, I feel, is the most important part of the process, is not just collecting it, but getting it out there. Absolutely. How about that? Yeah, and to add to that, I, I think for us first, understanding the data is important. Um, once understanding that data, how it could be used, um, as Kate said, to maybe um, coach an associate, at an associate level, uh, provide the organization with the overall health um, of the claims department or specific department, depending on um, who's using it. And also used to really consistently measure, it's a, it, the consistent measuring tool to identify areas that need improvement. Um, data is great, but understanding what I would say Kirsten says, the story behind the data and being able to provide specific measurable data that helps show your audience, whoever it is, whether it's uh, management and associate, um, to help develop a map for improvement um, and show what this specific results are really, really driving at. So data is great, but under, being able to understand what's behind the data is a key in making sure that it's pretty specific and measurable to be able to use the data like uh, Kate said. Yeah, and I would absolutely agree with that. And you mentioned, um, or you all mentioned, um, using the data to tell the story and report back. Um, I'm curious, across your organization, your reporting line, is that um, up, down, across? Um, in your experience, what works best 
to uh, continue to drive improvement through your organization? I think it's a combination uh, for us. It's a combination of across and up um, and possibly down depending on um, what we're dealing with. Um, but I think all three actually factor in for us um, because we are utilizing it from an associate level to a peer-to-peer -peer level, uh, doing a peer-to-peer -peer review and, and understanding the differences of the data there, and then uh, being able to provide that above. Similarly, we're using it primarily as a coaching tool, not just for reporting to upper management, but also to give the supervisor a structured opportunity to work with each adjuster individually on potential coaching opportunities or on things that they're doing well to give them, you know, praises. Uh, it, it gives more of an opportunity for those one-on-ones that, you know, the day-to-day -day grind doesn't usually allow for. Yeah, it can absolutely help in the one-on-ones especially. Kirsten? So we use it across and up. Uh, one of the things that hasn't been mentioned is that we actually calibrate. We spend a lot of time calibrating among the, the reviewers so that we can ensure that we're looking at, yes, you know, the questions are pretty yes and no, but there's still subjectivity that, that comes into play. It, it, doesn't, it doesn't matter what type of a tool that you're going to use. So that is an, a, an important component. Um, and then, again, we focus on a more of a team, uh, more of a line of business, more of a departmental um, gauge as to how it is that we're doing. We don't use it as an individual or a, any type of a, a direct coaching tool. Right. So two different uses there, but still very helpful in, in uh, uh, building your QA department according to that which the claims department would or the claims organization would like to see. So it's all tailored to, to the claims organization that you guys come from. So very good perspectives there. Um, and that leads us to question number five is building from your experience and knowing that we've talked about all the different points that we've talked about today. Um, what advice would you give to someone looking to evolve their own QA program? Question open to the panel. Well, from my perspective, the, the first suggestion is obvious. You know your business. Know what your business needs are. You know who your audience is going to be, whether this is going to be departmental or whether this is going to go up. Uh, whether you need an entire department or just a few people who are trained in doing this or whether you're going to go peer-to-peer -peer on it. Uh, and then what are the results going to be used for? Is this purely for a compliance standpoint? Is it going to be used for training and coaching, for reporting the health of the business? Those are all things that need to be outlined before you can build on the, the answers to build a QA department. To piggyback off of what Kate is saying, um, I would say, you know, there's uh, as many approaches to measuring as there are QA programs out there. And what it comes down to, once you've sort of decided what your base is and what your objectives are, what what is the tool that you're going to use? And over the amount of time I've been in the industry, I've seen numerous tools, um, and some are, uh, are you know, uh, manually intensive and, and take a lot of time. Um, but what you're trying to do is find the best tool that allows those users the, the ease of capturing that data in a straightforward, simplified approach. Um, because you're really, at the end of the day, you're going to measure the same things. We've talked about the three or four areas that you're going to measure. They might be unique to the industry, to your particular organization, but you're going to measure the thing, same thing. So, you know, why not have a tool that's user friendly? that then gives you some graphs that, that I don't have to spend all of my time back behind the scene um, analyzing the data um, and going through spreadsheets when I can really focus on sharing that story and giving those leaders the, the results that they need at their fingertips so that they can drive to whatever um, objectives they have. All right, good point. Absolutely. The leaders need to have the information at their fingertips as much as the QA department does. Absolutely. Well, and 
to add to that, Christina, is, you know, just to build on, you know, understanding what you really want to measure from a department or an organizational level um, and different and the objectives that you're trying to achieve, um, which is which I think is really important when developing a pro QA program. Uh, another thing that I realized is um, don't be afraid to change a QA process or a QA questionnaire if it's not yielding data that you expect to capture, um, whether it's specific or general. Um, over the years, I've found that if you, you know, can become very stagnant using one questionnaire or one set of questions in order to be able to try and achieve certain results. Um, and with using, you know, the current tool now is being able to change that QA questionnaire if it's not really effective um, and not be afraid to. Yeah, absolutely. So when if you're noticing that some questions are not getting any traction or they're NA time after time, then that's probably a question you don't need in your questionnaire. And so looking for a revamp for that as well. Um, that's absolutely good advice. Um, thank you all very much. Um, I would I would ask one last question of you. Um, if you had to pick the highest um, item that would be your one step for starting the change of your QA or the development of your QA program, what would that be? Well, for me, it would be the flight. Oh, we're all going to talk at the same time. Sure. Uh, I don't want. <laughs> they, uh, I have to find what the baseline is. And, and uh, before I even try to identify what are the areas that we're going to measure, where are we? So I've gone into organizations and done sort of baseline review so that I can then determine where do I start? What is it that I want to measure? What am I going to you know, share and align with the leaders so that we can have that focus? Um, and sometimes that's just a necessary uh, task that a QA person needs to accomplish when you're really looking at, you know, sort of evolving or uh, expanding your QA program. Do I really know where we are now? Um, and if I don't know where we are now, I don't know how to, to, to go forward um, and, and really uh, develop that program. Great point. Know your baseline, absolutely. I know Kate and Doc were ready to say something. Do you want to go first, Doc? Okay, Kate. <laughs> uh, well, from my perspective, um, as my position in QA is much more of IT, uh, the the most important thing is knowing what you want to collect data wise. Do you need a binary yes no answer? Do you need a one to five score? Do you need uh, a text field where you can put in notes? And then building or having the tool that accommodates that need and being able to compile the data in a consumable manner, that would be the first step for me for building that tool or finding that tool. And from there, I would build out to what the questions would be, how they would be applied and where they would go to. Good point. The data is very important, um, especially when you're building your questionnaires and your system uh, to support the rest of the department and the rest of the claims organization. Absolutely. Doc? Yeah, and from, the, from a claims organization, um, I, I agree with Kate in really focusing on, you know, what you want to build out um, and specifically what you're looking to measure. Um, but then it, it, along with that is, again, finding the right tool that gives you that flexibility to be able to really uh, have a benefit for your QA program. Um, I think we've all had issues where we've run into QA programs that really haven't um, given you the results or have developed the way they should be. And that's really key is being able to take that information and building that benchmark and being able to adjust um, with the flexibility of a tool that will allow you to adjust. Right, absolutely. The flexibility of the tool is important. Also, the flexibility of the claims organization to also allow the QA organization to adapt to the trends that they're seeing and build that into, um, say, a secondary questionnaire or an evolving questionnaire, as you put it, Doc. Very good point. Or, e 
or even just identifying maybe a best practice that um, doesn't make sense that needs to be changed from a process standpoint. Um, I, I think those are some of the key drivers and being able to get behind just the numbers, being able to focus behind the story of what it's really telling you. Yep, absolutely. And so we circled all the way back around to tell the story. I appreciate that. <laughs> and that's basically what QA departments do is we try to drill down into the information and the data weeds and pick out what are the best points for the claims organization to work on to improve their processes. And that's basically the baseline, I think we can all agree, of a QA organization or a successful one at that point. So um, thanks everyone for all of your wonderful answers and insightful and in sharing your experiences with us. I know that Mike has some more information to share as well. And I'll turn the mic over to Mike. Mike, over to Mike. Your turn. Thanks, Christina. Um, uh, yeah, so I want to share some more information on, on Envoy and also get to the Q&A. We've gotten a, a, a few great questions in here. If you still have questions, uh, again, just submit them in that, that uh, GoToWebinar widget, and uh, we'll get to them in just a second. But just kind of an overview here, because you did hear uh, Doc and, and, and Kate and Kirsten reference it, TeamThink Envoy, which is a, a self-administered tool for quality assurance, especially at a, a small, mid-sized enterprise that's growing or evolving their QA program. Uh, it really allows for um, an organization to get those, those granular details. And we saw on the pain points earlier, uh, a couple of the pain points were, uh, one, being able to get that, that quality measurement of data and, and, and getting that rich data set. And two would be uh, really decreasing the amount of, of labor hours used in pulling that data. And that's something that, that Team Think Envoy um, is really able to do. So uh, because it's self-administered, because it gives you the ability to, uh, to edit questionnaires on your own, it gives you the ability to upload the data on your own, it gives you the ability uh, to drill into different levels of hierarchy uh, across your organization and then visualize that data uh, and be able to uh, drill into the level of detail that you need to in order to improve performance across your company. Um, if you have further questions on Team Think Envoy, I'd uh, be certainly uh, more than happy to get into a demo and a further discussion of that um, and, and how that could help out your, your organization and any of the, the points that you see there. Um, we'll throw my email up uh, at the end here. We'll throw Christina's email up. Um, we'll also be sure to include both of those on a, a follow-up email with this webinar recording as well. Uh, but as promised, I do want to get to the, the Q&A portion where we have some of the um, audience members be able to ask some of the questions. Uh, so the first question we have is, how is QA used in your organization to performance manage staff? i.e. if staff aren't held accountable for results, are they going to actually follow it? Uh, so I open that up to the floor. I'll jump in here. So as, as a smaller claims department, um, using it as a performance management tool, I think is a small portion of, of what we're trying to achieve. You know, we're focused on really developing your coaching on consistency of our uh, claims file handling um, and making sure that we meet regulatory requirements. So, um, you know, there is a small portion of performance, uh, I would call management that you would deal with. Um, but for the most part, it's really to develop the coaching needed, especially with, you know, making sure that um, best practices are followed and especially meeting the regulatory um, requirements, requirements for each state, which can be a challenge because they change. I would say for us, uh, so we take a more holistic approach. Uh, we use a data for uh, and the results, as I mentioned, uh, more on a team or a line of business or an organizational sort of pulse. Um, in order for uh, anything to be utilized for performance management, it's got to be a statistically valid sample. Uh, the amount of reviews that we're doing on any one individual over the course of the year are, are probably not going to reach to a statistically valid sample to be able to us to hold our hat on that performance management. But I think what it does do, though, is it gives 
the, the management team the tools that they need to see, okay, well, I do have my group as a whole, we're missing X and consistently we're missing this, gives me an opportunity to coach at that high level. Um, they certainly can use it as a as a one-on-one -on -one conversation, but it would never be in a formal performance management um, usage. Good point. For us, it's pretty much a combination of what Doc said and what Kirsten said. Uh, we we tailored our questionnaire for the purposes of being able to use it as a tool for coaching in one-on-one, -on -one. but we do use a statistically insignificant number of claims compared to our current inventory to use it as effective tracking for actual compliance uh, uh, for for uh, um, apologize for employee review purposes. So if you're only looking at 2% of an employee's entire inventory, that's not a true snapshot, but it does give the supervisor a gateway into maybe this employee needs further review, maybe we need to look at a few extra claims for this person, that sort of thing. It opens the door for potential improvement for the employees. So overall, it shouldn't be used, um, uh, what I'm getting from the three of you, as, as purely a, a performance management uh, uh, tool, but, but rather um, either the, the start of understanding what's going wrong in the process there, or, or really a training or coaching opportunity for that individual or, or for that division, right? Great. Yep. Yes. Great. So our next question, um, I know we, we heard earlier, Kirsten, I think it was you that brought up uh, focused audits. So any tips on designing a glance or, or focused audit? Well, I think that the beauty of the, of the tool is it allows you to just dive down into one area. So when you're doing your sort of these holistic quality reviews and you're seeing the graphs that are coming up and say, for example, an area is, that keeps it has a bigger slice of the pie is an investigation. You can now then go down and go, OK, what is an investigation? What are the drivers? Uh, that are pushing us so that, you know, we're having issues in this area and then do, build a slant review or a focus review, whatever you want to refer to it as, based on just that slant over a period of time. You know, once you've done the coaching, um, then go back and take a look. Well, how are we doing in this particular area? Um, and so I think there's a lot to be to be gathered from that because you can just narrow in on one or two areas or um, and change those behaviors in the in the long run. Great. Dr. Kate, anything to add to that? To add on what Kirsten said, you know, some data is meaningless without follow-up and the addition of a focused review could provide that follow-up to let you know if there's improvement, if it's stagnant, or if it's you know, retracting further. Yeah, and I think from a focused review, Mike, is is really um, both Kate and, and Kirsten said it greatly, is that focusing on one specific area, um, for me being an APD manager, I may be focused on appraisals um, and, and, and is the proper estimate being completed, uh, proper usage of parts, labor, those type of things, So, um, which could drive leakage. So um, being able to develop just a focus audit on one particular area um, is, is a real benefit to having that flexibility of not just doing an overall review or an overall audit on a specific file. Great. Right. And I would say that characterizing your questions to make sure you pinpoint um, what you want to focus on for the focus review um, to make sure you get those questions um, and the root causes to be able to get into the weeds of what it is you're focusing on so that you can pinpoint the trend, identify that, and then work towards the improvement on that as well. Uh, so the next question is actually uh, a bit of a follow-up to to the previous question, um, which um, and and one of the polls uh, around 
what the the primary goal of of quality assurance is and and that's what level of communication does your QA department have with the rest of the organization? Well, I'll take that first. Um, we work in, in uh, close partnership with all of the other leaders uh, within the claims department. Um, you know, I, I feel very strongly that I can give those leaders the information with, that they need to be able to drive to the results. Um, and I think communication is really key. Um, and that's why I always focus on that storytelling piece of it. Uh, you know, if I just give them a, I can just share, send a report to them and they can look over it, but it's that communication and that partnership that I think will um, take us much further down the road. For us, our QA department is myself and claims management. So there's a lot of communication going on there uh, to claims leadership of the QA results. And, but it also provides the visual tools for claims management to send a summary of the results up to upper management in the company, which it helps uh, round out her monthly reports or her weekly reports and just saying, these are the things we're working on, these are the things we're excelling at. And visually, it's much easier for upper management to consume that information if it's presented in one page format, whereas if it's communicated over several emails or over several spreadsheets, that sort of thing. So inside the claims department, the QA is very integrated. Outside, it's uh, communicated via graphs. <laughs> I would agree with Kate on that, being a smaller claims organization, uh, the claims leaders uh, were all involved in the um, product, QA process and in the Envoy product, so we're able to communicate on a regular basis about what we're seeing, the type of results, and then we're able to communicate that up to um, different levels of leadership to be able to say, hey, this is the trends we're seeing, um, and being able to provide reporting off of the tool um, and giving more of a visual on top of uh, numbers um, is a huge help for us because it tells more of a story. Absolutely. Great. All right, so we have time for one last quick question here. Um, and the question is, what are some best practices in your view to setting an audit schedule? Well, for us, we have a monthly schedule with a certain percentage of claims that we look at first of the month, every month. And then the uh, upper management has the length of the month to get the reviews completed before the next round gets posted. Otherwise, there's a backup and things fall between the cracks. So as long as we adhere to our first of the month, end of the month schedule, everything runs like clockwork. I take uh, at the beginning of each year, um, I take a look at our entire book percentage wise. We come up with a specific amount of uh, the main type of quality reviews that we're going to do so that, and then it's communicated with each of the lines of business, how many that is expected for them to complete over a year. We don't, we look data on a quarterly basis. So they have a quarter within which to complete reviews. That's our main one, so regulatory compliance, we again look at a quarter, um, and those are based off of the holistic reviews that we're doing. Uh, and then slants can be, depending on each line of business and what they're interested in, um, they could have it be on a monthly basis, they wanna look at one thing on this month, something else the next month, or they can do it quarterly, um, or they can just do it over a whole year. Um, but I would offer that if they did a slant over a whole year, uh, that it's probably going to be a whole other year before they get anything that's a positive result out of it. So um, that's kind of how you can utilize the tool. I would say the same thing from a standpoint of our claims organization is we focus on monthly and quarterly uh, reviews based off a certain percentage of the claims um, that we have. So. Pretty much it's the same type of process that I would say Kate and Kirsten do. Right. 
And just to, to piggyback off of that answer, um, that is something, you know, TeamThink Envoy easily allows the user to do is, is to upload a, a sample set of, of claims data, uh, perform those reviews at whatever cadence uh, the organization wants to, uh, and also randomly target or, or stratify your, your file selection of, of that, that claims data. So which types of files would you like to pull and, uh, you know, the reviewers to be able to review such uh, claims data. Um, so having said that, we are at the end of our webinar. Um, I really want to thank Doc, Kate, Kirsten, and, and of course, Christina on helping today and uh, uh, create such a, a valuable discussion. Um, I certainly learned a lot here. I hope the, uh, the folks in the audience were able to learn quite a bit as well. Um, as I mentioned earlier, we'll be sending out uh, the recording as well as the, the email addresses here if you have further questions for us or if you'd like to see a demo of our, our Team Think or Team Think Envoy solution, uh, feel free to reach out to us. But um, otherwise, everyone on the panel, thank you guys so much. This has been uh, a really yeah. informative and, and great. And uh, uh, hopefully everyone can stay cool out there today. Thanks, thank you, everyone. Thanks, Christina. Thanks, everybody. Thank you all. Have a good one. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah.